so yeah um i wanted to start doing some t formal teaching on on twitch i thought it was a bf idea uh just gonna start doing some uh copper plate calligraphy uh beginner style just for funsies uh and yeah i mean you can follow along as well uh i'm gonna go through i have my notes over here just so we know i came very prepared <laughs> for this stream very prepared this is also the worst angle for you to just be like hanging it down here i'll just do it here instead there we go uh yeah so I thought it would be a good idea to do it somewhat more formally on Twitch. And if someone wants to follow along with me, fantastic. And if not, you just want to watch, that's also cool. Uh, maybe learn a little bit of something. So that's super fun. And uh, yeah, so I mean, let's get started. Um, so I kind of want to go over the tools a little bit first. And I'm going to turn the music back on. And then you let me know if you can still hear me properly. Because I feel like having like no, no music in the background can kind of be a bit boring. So I'm going to pull out like all of my, like literally all of my pen holders. Do you need to see my whole collection? Maybe not, but I'm going to show them to you anyways. There we go. It's a bit ridiculous. Do you need all of these for copper plate? No, but these are all the pen holders that I have that I'm going to show. I hate this one. I'm going to tell you why in a second, but I hate this one. go there we go there we go this is a ridiculous collection do i need this many absolutely not okay but the ones that are the most pertinent for copper plate calligraphy are the ones let me zoom with the flanges let me make my i'm sure my mic is good are the ones with the flanges what's a flange may you ask it's this thing right here that comes out of the pen, uh, out of the pen holder. And there's many different kinds. I feel like a beauty guru every time I do this. I'm like, oh, look at it, <laughs> just so it focuses properly. And like this one, and like this one. So there's a bunch. Hey, Sarah. So the, look at look at all these that I have. Do I need all? Of, no. Some are pretty though, and I like them. So this is, this is used for a right-handed person, mostly for doing copper plate calligraphy, are ones with these metal flanges on them. All of these other ones are for different styles of calligraphy or straight pen holders. Generally speaking, for people who do copper plate calligraphy will be used with a lefty. I'm not a lefty, so I can't speak to necessarily, unless I'm in front of them, exactly how you would hold it differently. But generally speaking, from what I know from my lefty friends, you go with the straight pen holder. If I'm wrong, and if someone who's a lefty is in the chat somewhere, you let me know. So that's what these ones are. These are all straight. Generally speaking, I use a straight pen holder. They do write with right hand. I've, I've seen a few of them do it and they write like uh, up down, right? I think. The ones that I know here in the city will go with a straight pen holder generally. But yeah, I, I use the straight pen holders usually if I'm doing a broadage script. With a right-handed oblique, that's impressive. <laughs> that's so impressive. And then these guys are straight pen holders. So again, like I said, for me, for it's like broadage, like want to do anything other than a pointed pen script like Spencerian or copper plate, you can use these guys with in general. You can, you know, there are some rules, but some rules, it doesn't matter. You can break them all you want. That's so impressive that they can do it with the right hand. Just oblique. Then I have these ones, which I find are the most fun. Ah, oh, actually, hold on. I wanted to do a little, I hate these, and I needed to tell people why. I, I, I thoroughly dislike this one from, uh, from Speedball. Uh, I honestly, like, I've never felt so strongly about a pen holder in my life than, when this, than with this one. I know people use it a lot, and I see it be used a lot, and I'll show you why I don't like it. We'll go through a couple nibs after two, but this nib here, this is generally speaking a very good nib. This is a Nico G, I believe. Yeah, Nico, not a Zebra G, but either one, very good for um, beginners. And when you put them in, 
that's as pretty much as far as you can put them in. Thank you, Marco. <laughs> I'm so I see so many people using this. I'm like, how? <laughs> Look how far this goes out, okay? Because generally, let me pull another nib with another proper pen holder. Generally speaking, the center of your of your nib tines should give or take line up whoop, there we go line up sort of with the center of your of your pen holder look at this this is great i i when they're this far out they're so hard to control it drives me crazy so i keep this literally to show people what not to buy i i hand i, I hate these <laughs> plus I find for me because they're because it's not a, a flange like this where it keeps the nib in one place. This is a circle. This thing can ro rotates around when you're writing. Uh, oh yeah 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 yeah. No, this is my like PSA. Like please don't buy these. <laughs> if you can if you can find anything else, use it. I can't. I hate them. <laughs> but yeah, I find I I tried using it once, uh, like you know, oh, you know, I have a lot of people are, are using these and they're, they're pretty cheap. Let's go. Yeah. I was literally, and as I was writing, it was rotating around my pen holder. I was like, why? Why? Yeah, when, when it stays in the holder, it's true, Marco. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Anyways, so there's my thing. And again, I keep, I literally keep this as a, as an ink stirrer because I use the back as an ink stirrer. But honestly, so depending on where you live, Nola, if you live in the States, John Neal sells this one. This is the one I got when I first started learning like five or six years ago. John Neal, okay? This one, it's a dual, the dual pen holder, okay? The flange comes out because you can use it also as a straight pen holder if you want. Because you can put the nib in there or you have the flange. This one, she's a worker, workhorse. Okay. It's like the dual, dual pen holders. So it's definitely, it's on their website still. It's not, ex not expensive. Yeah. 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 No, this one, I I've literally had it. It was in my beginner kit when I first started learning. I use it all the time. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, the next one that I, I like, and I know not everyone likes the ones with the screws, but I like this one. Okay. Because this one, uh, I, I don't remember now. It's also on John Neal but it's this guy because this can fit a lot of different types of nibs. You don't need to have, like I have a, a couple of those, um, the EF, the, the really tiny ones. And I like those ones cause you can adjust the width of whatever nib you're using. I think you can probably also use the, the uh, crow quill ones in here too. Maybe, I haven't tested. I have a couple, but I haven't checked. Um, yeah, okay, so there, that's my little spiel on oblique holders. And then I have all these other ones. So this one I really like, it's very pretty. I take, if you ever on my Instagram, this one makes a lot of appearances on my Instagram. Uh, I really like this one. It's from uh, a guy in um, Turkey, MP Oblique. And I like this one, it's really comfortable to use. Uh, it's good also with like a little screw so you can fit whatever nib you need in there. So that's really fun. So I'll put these guys back in that holder. And then I have a bunch of other ones <laughs> that I will use sometimes. This one, I'm pretty sure I, I is actually specifically for Spencerian because this angle is different. Marco, you'd know more than me. I know you're in the chat, or I think you're still in the chat. You let me know. I think this one is specifically for Spencerian and I bought it because I liked the wood turning. I thought it looked like a chess piece. And now, especially with all the stuff from Queen's Gambit, I was like, yes. Give me something that looks like a chess piece. I'm, I'm in, but I'm I'm pretty sure this is like a more of a 50, 52 degree angle. By the way, if you hear music and then you hear a commercial, it's because I'm cheap and I don't pay for Spotify Premium. <laughs> so I apologize for the advertisements as I as I speak. So I put these away, and then I'll talk a little bit about these babies, which are super fun. So 
these are ruling pins. They don't look like calligraphy tools at all because they used to not be. These used to be for drafting. Uh, so when you, you can see here, there's a little screw that you can open up and then these split and then you re-screw and then they connect. Uh, it doesn't need a special holder, but I think they, yeah, I think they make them because that one's definitely a different angle. I've tried using it and like, oh, this is weird for, for copper plate. I just like the way it looked. I'm a horrible person. <laughs> um, but yeah, these are ruling pens, but these two specifically are from a brand called Dreaming Dog, which are really fun. Um, there's a lot of gestural calligraphy that gets done with these. It's really not for formal hands. Um, and they make different shapes and uh, different lines. Let me, two seconds. I have the perfect example. So I was in uh, Claudio Gill's Bruta class about a month ago. And this is done with either a folded pen or uh, a ruling pen. So, because you can either, this one's my favorite out of the two that I have from ruling, uh, from Dreaming Dog, sorry, of the ruling pens. Because you can do either a flat line, whoop, you can do like a flat line or you can do a point and it works out perfect. This one is a little bit more, uh, like it's not as wide. Oh, take your time, Sarah. I'm literally gonna be here probably till like, like 5.30, 6 o'clock, so don't stress. Maybe we'll get to the basic strokes at some point. <laughs> so yeah, so there are those two. Um, but yeah, they used to be drafting tools for when you wanted a really straight line on a map to doing like roads and things like that. So, but gestural calligraphy done with these, super duper fun. Actually, speaking of, this is a, a, an old ruling pen uh, from like a geometry set that I got from like an antique shop in like an old Stadler one from, I don't know, 40 years ago or so. Whoop, there we go. So same concept. I mean, you can just do some really fun lines. Whoosh. Yeah, I'm going to be here forever. <laughs> I'm glad you're excited. Uh, cool. So there's that one. And then these are folded pens. So it's a similar concept to the, the, the ruling pens is you can write with uh, like a flat end or like the pointed end and it just gives you more flexibility except for in here you can't obviously adjust how wide or not they are um, together or not so this one or wait what is it this one this one which i'll turn the correct way around i did with this guy on stream last week so it's just very thick very fun um still calligraphy still beautiful lettering it's just not copper plate that's all so i just want to go through some of those tools to show different things folded pens are the, are super fun if you don't mind making a bit of a mess because they're kind of unpredictable uh because if you're using them because they're a little less stable they're pretty flexible i don't know if you can and this one i made myself out of a coke can like you can literally or out of just like a, a a can and it's held together with tape here so if you press a little harder the ink will it will splatter it's really fun but you just need to make sure you're writing like an apron <laughs> or you're going to be a gigantic mess but super fun super great to use especially if you just want to make some marks on a page like who cares right so that's those guys cool and then I wanted to also talk a little bit about other tools that you can use to do specifically pointed pen. Um, and one of those tools is a pencil. I love the pencil. And if anyone who's watching doesn't know how to do calligraphy and is terrified or scared of buying the wrong thing or the wrong whatever, start with a pencil. Like this is like a, a, a slightly like fancier pencil. It's these like the black wing ones, which I love, don't get me wrong, but they, they're they more expensive than your regular HV. Um, you know, but something with like a softer lead. Um, and the reason why 
Let me just pull a pad of paper. By the way, if you can ever find these pads, these are great for beginners or practicing if you're an old hat at doing calligraphy. They're not that expensive. It's 100 sheets. I think it's 20 bucks. And it's like marker layout paper, so it's really smooth. So you don't have to worry about uh, your, your nib catching on paper. Um, so so if, it, if you've ever looked at people who do calligraphy, you'll, you'll notice that there's thin lines and then there's thick lines, right? And you know what I can do? I can imitate that with a pencil. Because you like pencils are really, really, really useful when it comes to calligraphy, especially when you don't necessarily want to go and fork out, you know, the 50 bucks to get a beginner kit from somewhere. Start with just a pencil. It's totally fine. Because um, you can definitely, you know, you do like your, your thin ups, like your thin hairlines, and then, you know, your, your downstrokes, and you just kind of And you're also committed a little less because you can erase your lines. <laughs> uh, my recommendation always for pencil though is, um, especially if you're trying to practice and you're really trying to get that thicker, that thicker uh, downstroke is get a lead that is, is softer. Because if you're gonna use like, a, like one of these, it won't work as well. Like you're not going to get any kind of difference in line weight between the, those ones, but you will with a softer lead because you can get really thin and then kind of like that. And you can really, um, you can really imitate like pretty good quality calligraphy, I find. So let's say, yeah, I'll just write the word happy. So no guidelines, so it's a little bit wonky, but you know you can definitely see that difference between the hairline and then the the thicker downstroke right there, and that's just with the pencil. So again, if anyone's watching who wants to follow along with me when I eventually <laughs> get to the actual actual work, um, use a pencil and a paper, and uh, you need a pencil, a paper, a ruler, and an eraser, and maybe a sharpener. It's pretty basic stuff. So. Now I, got, I went over those tools a little bit. Um, other optional tools are, uh, if you don't have printed guidelines, and I'll go over guidelines in just a sec, but um, a ruler, a ruler is good, which is good, uh, and a protractor. So essentially break out your old like geometry sets when you were in high school, if you if you if you took that kind of math. Um, and the reason why, so now I'm going to touch a little bit on guidelines. So guidelines are really important for consistency in your work. Um, I find that not a lot. I find that when one learns, myself included, because before I took a class, um, however many years ago that was. I didn't understand that guidelines weren't to like hold your hand because you're like a baby and can't do it. It's literally so your work is good. <laughs> like at least that's how I, I see it. Anyway, some people think probably differently than me, but that's kind of how I view it. Um, so especially with copper plate, proportions are very important. So um, generally speaking, We'll go a little bit over the terminology at the same time. Oh, sorry, I was adjusting my brightness instead of zooming. There we go. Generally speaking, whatever your uh, your x height. So let's say let's pretend it's definitely not because this is in inches and not in millimeters. But let's pretend that this 
is here, six millimeters. This is what's called the X height. Two, three, one here, day center, uh, waistline, baseline, and descender. So, also, you're going to see some of my actual crap handwriting. <laughs> you're super welcome. <laughs> um, if anyone has done not done calligraphy, but has looked into doing typography, it's the same terms because we, it's, you know, typography comes from calligraphy. I, I say this with a lot of authority, pretty sure. <laughs> so whenever you're writing a letter, uh, more specifically, well, with majuscules and minuscules, Mostly with minuscules, you're going to be sticking with between your X height. So this is your baseline. So this, if you have like a line piece of paper and you're writing like, you know, let's say my name or something, you know, E, R, I, and oh, and I should have done it in minuscules. What, 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 there we go. Um, your, your minuscules are going to fit between these two lines. And then this in here is for like whatever pops above, which is your ascenders. And then down here is for like, you know, your J's or your G's or whatever the case may be. So when you're doing calligraphy, the uh, specifically copper plate, the copper plate proportions are um, your X height is in this case, it's six millimeters. And then the A sender height and the D sender height are gonna be whatever this is times 1.5. And that keeps your proportions uh, really, really stable and even and like visually very pretty. So if we were going to do that, so our X height here, which is six millimeters, our A sender height is going to be nine millimeters and our D sender. Oh, you're going to hear some French ads <laughs> is also nine millimeters. So it'd be nine, six and nine. So, and this works with any type of X height. Uh, you literally just have to times it by 1.5 and it does translate into like inches and stuff too. It's just, it's easier for me to work in millimeters. Um, but yeah, that's the, these are the, the, the copper plate. Proportions. So it's like not written the most beautifully, but you know, if you're taking notes, you're super welcome for this wonderful graph or a uh, wonderful little like demo demo thing they made so now that i went over a little bit of that with like the tools and uh the copper plate proportions um before moving on and if marco you're still in here you're gonna be very happy that i'm gonna talk about this and it's about stretching okay it's about stretching before going into really doing calligraphy um when i went from part-time doing calligraphy to full-time doing calligraphy, I didn't take it that seriously. I regret it now of the amount of tension that I held in my neck. It hurt, uh, in my forearm, it hurt. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, physically calligraphy, if you do it for long periods of time can be pretty taxing on your body and you don't realize it. Uh, and I don't hear enough people talking about it specifically to beginners online. Um, legitimately it is so important to stretch stretch your body get up sometimes move around because like the worst is like when you when you're working and you don't realize it and you end up hunching like this and then all of your back sucks and then your arms suck and your neck sucks it's hard to sleep so a couple of good uh stretching that i like to do is even just sitting i don't have to get up is I'll just, I'll do this. I've done this a few times to, for, for students online and they're like, your wrist is, or your fingers are really flexible. It's because I've been cracking my knuckles since I was a kid. So I, I'm sure I just have like extra flexibility here. So don't be freaked out by how far back I can push my fingers. But, you know, I'll pull, pull this a little bit. Yeah, shoulders as well. For me, I get tension here. Oh, sorry, my camera up here. 
I get tension here on my forearm. So I'll pull this back a bit, just for a few seconds. And I'll do the other side as well. And then something I like, you know, I'll do a little, I'll pull a little bit. I'm not pulling, sorry, I shouldn't say I'm not pulling. I'm not a, I'm not a physiotherapist, but just a little bit here, just to, just to stretch out this muscle. And then I'll do the same thing on this side. And then I'll, I'll pull my shoulders up and then I'll, I breathe out. I like to time it sometimes with my breathing as well. Like, and I kind of like, I'll roll my shoulders and I'll really like pull them in, pull them in and then I'll really stretch them back. And I'll pull here a little bit too. And a little bit here too. And like already there, like my body feels a bit more, more relaxed. Honestly, we should be standing up. It's, I won't do it now. Cause like with the cameras and stuff, I, there's no real point, but you can do a lot of that standing up too. Cause like you're, when you're sitting all day, it's not good. Um, and then something that I started picking up. So something, this is from uh, Paul Antonio Scribe, if you guys have ever heard of him, uh, where he has the way that he sits in his chair you can kind of see there's a big gap. I don't sit fully back in my chair with my butt in that corner. I don't. Uh, I find that it really curls my the bottom of my, my tailbone weird. All right, Marco, thanks for coming by. I appreciate you. Come on back later. I'll probably still be here. <laughs> Going through slowly. Teaching, it's fun. Um, but yeah, I sit at the edge of my of my chair so there's good good space here but it's a bit more of an active position and like it kind of forces your back to remain straight i was the reason why i threw this on is uh <laughs> bye the reason why i threw this on is so you can see the contrast of like where the back of my chair is uh versus my back so I sometimes will rewatch particular clips of me on Twitch because I am like curious about like what my body's doing. And sometimes I'm just like, oh, my posture is horrible. <laughs> so I'm always aware of, and I try to keep my back straight. Like even if I'm bending, I'm not bending my shoulders. I'm trying to bend at my waist. And I find it easier when I'm sitting more at the edge of my chair than I am when I, uh, I'm fully back. Um, just at all. Even when I'm typing and stuff, I try not to sit all the way back because I find that it's my, the, my lower back sucks <laughs> afterwards. I get like a lot of pain. Um, so yeah, just a couple of things like that. So we're stretching, we're sitting at the edge of our chair. We're not sitting all the way back. Um, yeah. So that, and then let's see. I'm sorry. I'm just glancing at my notes. I'm like, where am I in my, in my order of operations? Da, 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 da. Okay, cool. So now that that part is a bit done, I'll, uh, I also, I wanted to talk a little bit about beginner nibs as well. So I had mentioned, so I have, I have a silly collection of nibs. And I keep them in this lovely box, all nice and organized. <laughs> How wonderful. So in here, I have some broad, broad edge nibs as well. So we're not going to pay attention to those. I am by no means a broad edge lady. I, I, uh, I don't, I don't do them very well. Uh, I don't want well, them. I know one script and I say, I know one script. I am familiar with one script. Uh, am I good at it? <laughs> well, will remain silent on that one. I won't really <laughs> delve too deeply into that. Um, but yeah, so good beginner nibs. If you ever look this up somewhere, anywhere on the internet, it's always gonna be the same couple of nibs that are gonna pop up. Uh, it's gonna be your Zebra G's and your Nico G's. So they pretty, sometimes I put, I throw them in here after I've used them cause like they're still fine. So there we go which is why you see a little bit of like ink on there. Actually, can I zoom in a little bit? There we go. So this is a Zebra G. 
This is an eco G. There is a slight difference when you're used to calligraphy that you can tell with these guys. Uh, I find the zebra G as a slightly rounder uh, set of tines at the very end. The Nico G is a little bit sharper. That's kind of how I view it. So with the zebra G and the Nico G though, they're both about the same about amount of stiffness. Now when I say stiffness, um, I mean resistance when you're bending them. Uh, let me see, how can I demonstrate this on something that's not too big? How about the lid of my ink? So when you press down, you can see the tines will separate. This is what gives you your thick lines, right? And same thing for the Zebra G. The difference between these two and other types of nibs is that these are pretty stiff, so it takes a bit more pressure to separate those tines. For beginners, I find this is a good thing because 90% of people are not gonna be picking up a calligraphy pen or a calligraphy nib in their lives. So you're used to using a ballpoint which you press hard, a pencil which you press hard, and it's always the same amount of weight. So usually when people are coming from a pen or a pencil background that's like a general, like a big pen, you have a really heavy hand. So you kind of need to have a nib that's able to take that type of like, I don't want to say abuse, because <laughs> this may be a bit harsh, but be able to take it without bending out of shape completely. Does this mean you can put your whole body weight on it? No, but generally speaking, like you can kind of press pretty hard on, on these guys and they, they always just pop back into shape. Not a big deal. Um, a nib that I like to go if you're kind of a beginner intermediate, if you wanna go that way, that I like, it's the Blue Pumpkin nibs. So I'm gonna use this one because there's no label on it. I'm trying to find one that is not been used so the blue hasn't come off. So it's the blue, the blue pumpkin nib. Although it's a brow, it's a browse steno, uh, but most people will just refer to it as the blue pumpkin because it's blue. And this one is a still stiff, but not as much. It's definitely more flexible, so you don't have to press as hard. Uh, to get it to open up. So if you're getting used to like, oh, the pressure that you need to be using on your nibs, um, this one is then a good one I find to like move up to is, is this guy, is that blue pumpkin. Then um, once you get more like relaxed and your hand isn't super heavy anymore, um, there are a couple that I'll tend to, to go towards. Um, I my favorite right now is an EF principle, which I actually have to get some because I only, I've been using them so much I think I only have one left. So, oh, by the way as well, nibs are consumables, okay? Don't try and keep these things forever and ever, please. <laughs> like, they're not gonna be good. Um, like, they're meant, they're meant to be thrown away. They're not expensive or like, they're very affordable, I should say. Uh, they're maybe between two and four dollars each. So, but they will last maybe depending on your usage, maybe a month or two. I want to say it just depends on how much you're using them because the nibs that the tips will go dull at some point, um, or the and you'll know when your hairlines aren't as uh, thin anymore, or um, like it'll be catching the paper a lot or making a lot more noise. So, the EF principle is currently my fave. I go through phases, but it's this guy. Or no, is this the Hunt? No, this is the F principle, cool. Because the Hunt 101 also looks very similar, but I find this one's better for me personally. It's like very, very flexible. It's very flexible, it makes really wide uh, hairlines. So it will like come out really, it's like maybe 20% wider than like the other ones, like an Eco G or a Zebra G. But and you also don't need to press down as much to get that width. Uh, and then I find there's one more that I really like using, but they're very finicky. And this is the Browse Rose. I find these ones are extra, whoa, come on, focus baby. No, there we go. 
And the reason why it's the brass rose, or people refer to it as that, is because of, there's a little rose stamped on it, which I think is quite fun. But um, with the with this one, it's there like it makes really thin hairlines and very thick uh, downstrokes. If you know Shin Long or Open in Inkstand on um, on Instagram, fantastic. She's hilarious. I love her. Uh, I I'm pretty sure she uses this one a lot and she uses the Hunt 101 a lot when she does does her Madras uh, script because it makes really 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 great thick juicy downstrokes are great but they're they're really finicky and i do not recommend these ones for beginners like i only started recently using them because i hated them at, at first because like i fucking hate, like sorry for swearing but like i freaking hate these they are the worst um but yeah now that i i i don't have such a heavy hand anymore these are much much better um but you know i mean i have a bunch of other ones i have some I have some in here that are like uh, old ones from, uh, I think I have ones that are like Bank of Canada, like from back in the day from like Tellers and stuff and Bank of Montreal and like all these old nibs. Um, I, I almost want to say they're antique, but I don't know if they're actually antique or not, but they're old. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have a bunch in here. I, I'll play around with some of them and that's why sometimes like I have a favorite and then I'll try something and be like, oh. Why haven't I used this one before? Or why haven't I used this one in like six months, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, but those are those are my basic like. So we're gonna go with beginner Nico or Zebra G. Beginner intermediate. We're gonna dip our toe into the uh, blue pumpkin uh, type of uh, type of vibe. A little intermediate, like we're being more comfortable. Hunt 101 or EF principle. And if you want to really try and be do some fun stuff and you're feeling really confident, then the Browse Rose. That's kind of my, my scale of what I would recommend. Cool. Uh, all right, and let's talk a little bit about ink. So, as you can see from before, I, I, I've transferred my Higgins Eternal into just like a jar. All right, thanks, Nola. I'm I'm happy that you were here. Uh, I appreciate you. The video will be up on Twitch after I'm done, whenever that is, <laughs> and you can come and watch. But uh, yeah, I hope I'm glad that you found it interesting. Bye. Uh, yeah, so talking about the inks. Um, there's a lot of debate on what's a good ink and what's not a good ink. I can just tell you what I personally feel about them. Uh, so, sorry, just double checking something. Cool beans. So I like the Higgins Eternal. So I'll show you what the Higgins Eternal actual packaging looks like because I have some extra. It's this one, all right. It's not the Higgins waterproof. It's not the Higgins calligraphy. It's the Higgins eternal one. Okay, this one, honestly, why why I recommend this one is it's great for practice because it works right out of the bottle. You don't have to mix anything. It, you, you don't have to troubleshoot it very much. It's very simple. Um, so when you're learning, I find trying to take away as many weird uh, obstacles uh, out of your way is gonna be great. So like trying to learn with ink that you have to make yourself or that's loose pigment and that you have to stir yourself or anything like that, I find it's almost a barrier to entry and it's harder for people to get, because they're, they're not sure, is it not working because of the ink? Is it not working because I'm a beginner? Is it not working because of the pen? when you're just using a solid ink that you don't have to mess around with, it can kind of take away one of those factors if you're worried about like what, like when you're trying to troubleshoot of like, why doesn't this work? Why isn't this working? Getting just a good basic ink is a good one. A lot of people like Sumi, Sumi ink, which is Japanese. Uh, I, I, I have a bottle, I don't use it often, but I figured I would bring it up because I know a lot of calligraphers love it. Uh, I find for me, because you have to dilute it, it's kind of, I don't want to say gloopy, that's not the right word, it's thick. 
So you have to dilute it. And I'm like, I don't have time to dilute my ink sometimes. I just want to sit down and go. So for me, for other people, they really like using the Sumi because the color is a bit better. Actually, that's that's a point as well. Higgins Eternal, when it dries, it has a it dries kind of gray. It doesn't dry true black, even though it's like a black ink. Um, it's like a, a grayish with like a it's a cold a colder gray. And there's, so there's a little bit of purple in there as well, uh, which I've noticed. When I'm practicing, I don't particularly care. Also, it's so funny because I have the camera down here. You see, I talk with my hands. <laughs> like, it's super crazy. It's so funny. Um, but the Sumi ink is, has a really lovely finish. Um, it kind of has a little bit of a sheen. It's much more of a true black. Uh, so it just really depends. Also, Sumi ink you can use, I think, on final pieces as well. Um, so what I use when I'm doing something that's for a client, let's say, that's like a final piece. I use gouache. So I will show you. I have a bunch. I wasn't kidding. I have so much. This is all my gouache. <laughs> so um, gouache is essentially uh, watercolor with, uh, I think it's white chalk or like something white inside to make it more opaque. Uh, it works pretty seamlessly on most papers that I've tried. It doesn't bleed too much, uh, if at all, as long as you make sure that it's the correct thickness. This is going to take a lot more like finagling. The best gouache, even though it's bloody expensive, is this one from Schminky. Um, it's literally calligraphy gouache. You don't have, you, you, you have to, it's literally paint. And I have, uh, this one is almost done, which is why I have a new one. So it's like it literally a tube of paint. So you have to dilute this. Um, I usually use, or two, one of two things I will use to do mixing with gouache to make it ink. Um, I will either use these little guys. These are called dinky dips. I've only ever been able to find them online via paper and ink arts or John Neal or on Etsy. All of them come from the States, which means all of the time they always have customs on them. So uh, the last time I ordered, I ordered like, I think I ordered 20 of them. Uh, these little jars because they're like the perfect size to put your let me just put a, a nib in my pen holder to like dip it's like the perfect width it fits right in goes out we're good to go and then you 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 only need to make a small amount at a time uh, most of my dinky dips right now are full of ink or paint uh, like depending on what use I've had for them. Cause I like, especially if it's for a client project, I like to keep it for a little bit just in case they come back and like, can you match exactly the color that you mixed for me? I'm like, oh, I threw it away last week or like I washed it out, right? Um, usually as well, they come with like a little, like just it's a wooden holder with like whores, holes bored into it so you can put the dinky, uh, the, uh, the little plastic container in there. Uh, I specifically, I, I spray painted mine, so they just look a little bit better because it gets full of paint anyway, so like who cares? Uh, so I just spray painted mine. I have a black one, a white one, and a tan one. Uh, or you have these little guys, which are like little suction cups so you can stick it on your desk or on your hand because it works there too. Uh, so those are good little containers, like little like ink, mini inkwells pretty much. Uh, or something else I do is I, ha I had bought these big jars. They're not, if I tip them, they might fall, they might like leak. But um, if you're mixing a large amount, like let's say you're doing something that's really big and it, it's white, a little dinky dick isn't, or like these little guys, it's not gonna be enough. So I have white in one of uh, one of these, let me see what I got here. This one in particular has separated. So there's water here and then there's my paint. Uh, but I, this is has a magnet inside. I have a magnet stir, so like when I turn on the magnet stir, it goes and it'll mix it for me. Tools that you don't necessarily need when you're a beginner, but just so you know, 
so yeah, it just kind of depends. And Higgins Eternal, I just throw it in there because it's just easier than using the 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 lid from uh, the the vessel that it comes in. Oh, and also the reason why I don't, did I mention why I like gouache? Yeah, it doesn't like bleed because it's it's good stuff. And then, yeah, for paper, for beginners, I had mentioned already, but I'll show you this one again. I like this one from Canson. Uh, it's marker layout paper, 70 grams or 18 pounds. I'm a terrible calligrapher. I never remember why, what that means. I'm sure someone, I'm sure someone with more knowledge knows that. I just know this one works. Uh, so there's that guy. Or I uh, really enjoy the Rhodia paper. Which is this guy. Big fan. Uh, I find I find it even better than the Canson one, but this is a little bit more expensive for practicing. Um, it just depends on what kind of experience you'd like. I find this one a little bit smoother than this one, but this one's much more cost effective than this one. Um, this one also comes in like a standard like North American size, whereas Rodia is made in France, I believe. So this is European sizing. So this is like an A4, something like that. Yeah, it's A4 paper instead of like eight by eight and a half by 11, which is like how in North America we would refer to it as, whereas this is nine by 12. So um, a little bit easier to cut down to a specific size too, if you wanna like throw this in your printer and print some guidelines on it. Uh, so there's that. Then you can kind of, once you've, you're you done with your practice paper, you can kind of dive into like, there's there's so much paper out there. I'm a huge fan of handmade paper. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live really close to a, uh, a paper mill. Uh, literally less than 10 minutes from my house uh, is a paper mill in Montreal. Great. I have... If you ever watch or like look at anything on my Instagram and you see like just these crazy deckled edges, this is from from there. This is all handmade paper that I love. It's so textured and fun and beautiful and it feels nice. It's all cotton. Um, but this definitely because of like all the ridges, which you can see the shadows on, like it's a bit more challenging to work on. Definitely wouldn't say for a beginner, but you know, there's a lot of options out there. There's a lot of companies out there that do like straight up cardstock and um, you know, you can kind of fiddle around. But for our purposes today, we're gonna keep it with the Canson, super basic. You can get it at Michael's, you can get it at Desire if you're in Canada, um, or Michael's in Canada as well. I think most art supply stores probably have this one and I find it really cheap. Um, oh yeah, also watercolor paper works really well. Uh, like Arches is really nice. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I mean, I can go on and on with paper forever and ever, but you know, just so you know, there's a lot, there's a lot out there. It, it's kind of crazy and a bit overwhelming. So we'll just keep with this guy. Uh, okay, cool. So yeah, all right my notes here. Let me just get to a little warm up sheet. Da -da -da -da. I have warm up drills. So these are my favorite ones. So you're like, Aaron, what the hell is a warm up drill? Why do I need to warm up? It's just calligraphy. You're sitting down. I'm not running a marathon. Warming up is silly. Warming up is not silly. I'm telling you here. I'm telling you now. <laughs> Again, if you're hearing an ad, I'm too cheap to pay for a Spotify premium. Although maybe if I do this one on like every Thursday, I probably should to leave the music on without having French ads pop into your ears. But uh, yeah, anyways, so these are some just templates that I made myself uh, to help myself. So when I'm talking about having a warm up for your hand and for your lettering. Um, usually, if you don't warm up a little bit, your hand's gonna be shaky, it's gonna be uh, tight, 
it's not going to be super fun for you to work and your lines will be shaky until you start working and then if you work like uh, from the top of the page down to the page you're gonna see that uh, there's going to be a big difference between um, how tight your letter and and how tight your warm-ups are from the top to the bottom so instead of doing that on like your work let's say I like to try and and do it a little bit more on like a random piece of paper so I'll do it with a pencil first so you can see what I mean so like I mentioned at the beginning of the stream when you're working with copper plate specifically it's a lot about the the contrast between the hairlines the thin lines and the downstrokes like the thick lines um, that's kind of where a lot of the beauty of it comes from is having that contrast so you have to get used to uh, making your hand do that because it's not something that's instinctual unless you've done calligraphy before um, I'm also going to So something that also uh, beginners don't tend to be told a lot from everyone is having a, a guard sheet. So when I say a guard sheet, you're like, what is this? I've never heard of this term before. Uh, essentially, when you're writing on a paper over and over again, there are, there are oils on your hand that you're going to be like wiping on the paper. If you're working with ink, that will make the ink not adhere to the paper properly if that makes sense. So uh, um, I don't like guard sheets because there have been more than one time where I've knocked the guard sheet because normally what it is, you just have a, a paper here and like you're working and you keep your hand on this one and it protects this guy. More than once I've knocked this and I've ruined whatever I've been doing. So I quote invested the whole $10 for these very professional looking finger gloves on Amazon and they're black. So if I get ink on them, no one cares, no one sees, it's fine. Uh, and then I can slide over cause these are meant more for um, like if you're doing art on a tablet, let's say uh, to, so you can, your hand can smoothly go over the glass um, of whatever tablet you're using for lettering or for drawing or whatever. But I'm like, this works perfectly fine for my purposes as well. It was about 10 bucks from Amazon. And now I don't have to worry about my hand knocking a paper into my wet ink. <laughs> Learn from me. Learn from my mistakes. So, so let's start a little bit with some warm-up drills to warm up our hand, to warm up our, um, our wrist a little bit, and warm up our pressure on the paper. So you can kind of see, you can kind of see through, I think. Yeah, that should be okay where it says clockwise. Let me, can I do only overhead? calligraphy tip. <laughs> Do you like that animation? So nice. Uh, when working, you should definitely... Uh
that was the end of my calligraphy tips, <laughs> at least for that portion anyways. of a uh, whole arm movement um, type of thing, like when I'm working. So you can see it on that bottom camera, which is why I switched back. When I'm going, I'm not moving my fingers. I'm not moving um, my wrist. I'm moving my, my whole arm. And this is really, like I'm not really manipulating this that much, if at all. Uh, I'm really just, holding it and the only thing I'm really adjusting is the pressure of how much I'm pressing on the paper itself so it's and then down but you can see I'm not doing this I'm not doing this I'm really keeping it pretty straight so this was a a, a thing I, I picked up from I did a, a class with uh, Martha Lawrence or uh, Martha scribes on Instagram she's Fantastic. I did like an intensive Spencerian workshop with her. Oh God, that girl was amazing. <laughs> but she really kind of went through it and I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize I was using my wrist so much because I was trying having a little bit of like a tension uh, in my lower forearm and I couldn't figure out why. And it was because I was at, without knowing I was using my wrist like way too much. Um, so when you're kind of doing that whole arm uh, movement, Sorry, as I wanted to adjust, as I, what I had done was as I was talking, I had slipped back in my chair. So let's try and keep on the edge like I had mentioned before. Um, yeah, when you're kind of doing this, you're really not moving. You're moving your arm. The paper is, you know, rotated. And I'm pressing as I'm pulling the pencil towards me. So like you can really just fill up a whole paper like this. It doesn't also have to be this like small or big, depending. You can do like the whole page and just do, just do this, just to to kind of get the feel of the paper, uh, get the feel of your wrist. Make sure everything is nice and warmed up. Get used to that pressure and like release motion. Uh, and then we can do counterclockwise. So same kind of concept. We're gonna go if we're moving down towards us. We're gonna be pressing, and then away lifting so it's lighter. I'm not moving my wrist. I'm not moving my fingers. we go so now we have one we're going clockwise and the other we're going counterclockwise uh, so then this one whoop. the problem I have my iPad like kind of on on like a physical thing that's here that I can't move out of the way unless I lose my angle so things that are a little lower down the page I'm gonna have to don't do it like this like for yourself <laughs> this is just for me so I can show so you can see what's going on down here so this is gonna be an infinity loop and we're gonna do the same kind of concept of when we're going down towards us, we're gonna be pressing and then away is gonna be light. So you can, like I said, you can time it with your breathing. Um, like when you're breathing, uh, when you're moving down, you're breathing out and then up, you're breathing in. So you can kind of get a nice motion and uh, a breathing pattern. Uh, and also if you time it with your breathing, you can make sure that you're not breathing too quickly. Uh, and because Going quickly and going fast when doing warm-ups, like it's part of the process of 
getting ready to do calligraphy and doing like a good practice session. It is really about, you know, taking your time. It's not something that you can really rush. So like try and enjoy it, you know? So it can be, like I said, I mean, kind of meditative. Um, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see. And I'll turn the brightness up. There we go. So breathing in and then breathing out. So something like that. And if you wanna not do when you're breathing and you just kinda of wanna go a little bit faster, you can do that too. But it's really about that, trying to be kinda of consistent, getting used to that motion of uh, the back and forth, uh, getting used to uh, the switching between no pressure and pressure, uh, especially when you're a beginner, can be a very good habit to, to, to make. Like I said, don't do, <laughs> right now my paper's literally sideways, uh, just so the camera can pick it up. So I'll try and angle it a little bit better so you can see. And I'll, I'll do this so you can see my back too, like where I'm not doing this. I'm, I'm leaning from my hips, uh, from my waist, not from my shoulders, or I'm trying not to. Anyways, I'm trying to be a good example. <laughs> so the cone shape is super interesting. If anyone has seen uh, Shenlong's book calligraphic uh calligraphic drawing which is here uh a lot of her animals for example are made with essentially warm-up exercises right that they're put into the shapes but they go from bigger to smaller to bigger to smaller um so being able to do that kind of consistently it can be really um, important. So that's also why I, I like doing the cone shaped. So you can do small to big to small again. So uh, you can do it with either the, the ovals or you can do it with the, in, the infinity loop, whatever you like better. It doesn't really matter too much. It's just more so you can kind of get that, the habit of being able to consistently um, change sizes like when you want to and you can have the control doing it. Lovely little ad break. I'm really, I'm going to have to pay for a Spotify premium. This is so rough. <laughs> You can really just kind of go back over as well. It doesn't really matter. There we go. So that's a couple of these guys. And then uh, another template that I have made is my little pizza. So the pizza is also fun. It then it kind of it's essentially the cone, right? So, you know, you can but you can do it, uh, you know, in, in many different areas. It makes a fun little pattern. So, you know, let's say we're gonna do infinity loops all the way down. So infinity loops, actually, by the way, that look like this, uh, these are great little Christmas trees. If you look at them kind of this way, make good little Christmas trees for cards. 
pro tip. Should I, wait, hold on. Let me, let me do this. Pro tip, <laughs> little calligraphy tip. This warm up exercise is a great Christmas tree for a Christmas cart. There we go. And we're back. <laughs> Ta da! I like my little animations, I think they're so fun. And then we're gonna go from small to big. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. So now that I'm getting a little looser too, you can really. You know, so you can kind of make fun things. You can go and do infinity loops, you can do ovals, you can do whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's just more the exercise again of uh, away from you is thin, towards you, thick, and getting used to that pressure and release. Sorry, I just thought, thought something popped up on my screen. Apologies. So. Now that we have that out of the way, and I was doing it with the pencil, uh, I'll I'll ex switch exclusively to the pen uh, and nib uh, moving forward, except for just when I, I, I'll do a couple of the basic strokes in uh, a pencil just to kind of show you the, the idea, but I think everyone understands that you can do whatever I'm doing with a nib and ink. You can absolutely do it with a pencil. Um, I just really want to make it really accessible for people to understand like you can do it with whatever tool you have available to you. You don't need to have this to practice calligraphy. Um, yeah, okay, I'll get off my soapbox on that point now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so something I didn't mention before with the nibs, which I didn't know when I first started and it's becoming more common knowledge now, so it's great, which makes me very happy, is when nibs are shipped, they are shipped with a, like a fine oil on them, which you don't notice to the naked eye, but it makes it so uh, ink doesn't like to stick on the nib. Um, and I will show you. Oops. So. I've just been shoving my, my finger oils all over it to try and demonstrate, because I've, I've cleaned this one before. Um, so let me get my Higgins Eternal. So my Higgins Eternal is a little bit older. Uh, also something to keep uh, an aware of is if your lid stays open on your ink, things it will evaporate at some point so it does get thicker so you just have to add water every so often uh you'll start to notice like when it becomes really kind of uh like thick like you, you can't do hairlines anymore when you were able to before just add a, like a couple of dry and i'm not talking open up the sink and like and throw it in there i'm saying like a, like a couple of drops of water at a time okay don't go crazy let's keep it let's keep it cool guys so As you can as you can see, this is I don't really care so much about the prettiness of this particular plastic pen holder. I just stirred my ink with it. Um, but yeah, there you go. That was the Higgins Turtle. And then let me see. Oh yeah, this one's a bit too clean. So normally, what will happen is this is what it should look like. Oops. So I get ink on my fingers because I'm a noob. So. This is what it should look like. It should be fully covered. And it should be covering, see that hole that's there? It's called a vent or the well uh, right in the middle there. That should be covered. So normally it's just a hole like this, just like that. So when the nib is clean, that's what will happen. When it is not clean, what will end up happening is that the ink will bead because there's oil on it. So to clean that, I, just, I have like a little tiny jar of Windex that I keep nearby on that part of my desk. 
So there's a lot of ways to clean a nib. There's you can just shove it into a potato, which I don't, I don't do. I'm like I don't want to ruin a potato and like poke it with like nibs and leave it there for a few minutes. It's fine. Uh, I'll just use Windex. It's fine. It's cool. I, I know some people will lick them if they're they don't have Windex with them too. I'm like I don't know if I want to put whatever chemicals are on a nib in my mouth, especially during the time of COVID. So, but yeah, essentially you just kind of like dip it in and you rub it off and then you can test and then as soon as the nib is fully coated when you dip it into the ink the oil is gone uh you just have to be careful like i like i was trying to put some of my finger oils onto the nibs themselves uh, the nib itself but uh it didn't work for my demonstration purposes but sometimes that can happen if you're you're handling it and moving it out with your fingers and putting it in with your fingers just maybe with a little bit of water test to see but anyways the point is this is what the coating should look like. There we go. So it's fully coated. All right. So we're going to start moving into the eight basic strokes. But before we do that, I have to talk about guidelines a little bit. So I had mentioned before that when I started to, to learn on my own, I didn't understand why people used guidelines. I thought like, oh, you should just be able to write straight on a line, which is crazy because I can't even write straight when I write normally. Like, how am I going to do calligraphy straight on a, on a line? If I, do, I can't even do it in my regular garbage handwriting, right? Anyways, so having some kind of guideline. So like these are the ones I've, I've made for myself. And also the benefit of this paper pad is uh, I can see through it. You can kind of see it on the, on the camera on the stream. When I zoom in, you can see it a little bit better. Um, I also have a light pad, which is useful for me. Not everyone. Hello, Sarah. Welcome back. Um, not everyone uh, has a light pad and that's fine, but that's also why I like using this paper because it is a little bit transparent. Uh, so yeah, these are just guidelines I made uh, for myself. The X height that I talked about before for these ones are six millimeters. So right here, which means this is nine and then this is nine. We're keeping that proportion nice. So um, guidelines are important to make sure that your work is straight. Um, the thing that I see the, literally the most online with beginners is that like they're trying to learn but they don't have guidelines and they're not working on a straight line and like their letters get all wonky and they get mad at themselves and they're like you just need to use a guideline and you would be so it'd be so much easier so much better off um and if you don't want to make like you don't want to print off guidelines ah uh, god what was the website they just came out with it um it's like calligraphyguidelines.com.org dot something they, if you look at, I think if you Google it, it'll pop up uh, where you can literally print off guidelines of whatever X height you need for whatever purpose. Yeah, calligraphy. I love calligraphy crush. Such a good online mag. But I, I, I know they made a URL directly for the guidelines. But if you don't want to make your own, just go there, print it off, or the old school way, just using a ruler and just going and using a pencil and just ruling your guidelines that way. Um, that's what I used to do when I when I first started learning, like actually learning properly. I just, uh, oh yeah, thanks Sarah, that'd be so great if you can toss it into the chat. So uh, I'll go into the basic strokes. That. We talked about this. Da, 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 da. Cool. All right. Look at all of my points. How very fun. So, yeah. So, we're going to start with the basic stroke. So, what are the basic strokes? So, essentially, every letter in calligraphy is made up of specific strokes depending on the script that you're doing. For the purposes of copper plate, there are eight uh, basic strokes. 
one is your actually yeah so I'll do this part just in pencil so it's easy to see one is the entry stroke which should be thin it's because my pencil isn't sharpened hold on a second let me just sharpen doo -doo -doo -doo. I'll erase that there we go so we're going with an entry stroke then we're going with a downstroke. So now, remember all that warm-up stuff that we were doing before, downstroke should be thick. There you go, guidelinegenerator.com slash calligraphy. Thank you, Sarah. Coming in clutch. <laughs> I super appreciate that, thank you. But yeah, if you don't wanna make your own guidelines, go there, print them off, super easy. Uh, oh yeah, and I'll, I'll actually quickly line this so you can definitely see it and a center are 55 degrees is right here I think that's good yeah I think that's clear all right cool so downstroke like I said before we're moving we're pulling towards what's going to be uh, pressure and so there's the one between the ascender the waistline baseline this is the descender line is here so Ah bon, French, French ad, lovely. <laughs> so funny. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna be purchasing Spotify Premium. I hate these ads coming up. <laughs> Anyways, um, then we're gonna have a downstroke in between the waistline and the baseline. Then we're gonna do one called, actually, so this will be the entry. This is the This is the downstroke. This one is the understroke, or underturn, sorry. Oh my God, I did that completely wrong because the ads are literally distracting me. I can't even imagine you guys. Sorry, it's this way. There we go. So this is the, the underturn. Then we're doing a, a descender loop. Or actually, I'll stop it here. There we go. Descender loop. We got our overturn. Uh, overturn, yeah, ascender loop. Mm, yeah. Your compound curve, and then the The oval. So these ones are your eight basic. So these are your eight basic strokes. All the letters in the calligraphy in the copyright calligraphy alphabet are made with these strokes shoved together. For example, the letter A is an entry stroke. Zoom that in. Plus an oval plus an underturn is is an A. So every letter 
and the alphabet can be made with these eight basic strokes. When I learned this, my mind went, what's the, the mind explosion emoji? I was like, cool. I never thought about that. So, and as I was doing it too, it's a little bit harder with the pencil to see, but I was pressing. So here is a bit thicker, here is a bit thicker. Hairline, thick, hairline, thick, hairline, thick, hairline. So something as well that I'll mention now, um, essentially what should happen with the oval, which is she's important in the copper plate. And the reason why she is important is because this is what gives you pr your proportion for the rest of your letters, for the rest of your, your, uh, your word, let's say. Let's say you do the word dog, okay? So. Yeah, like that, okay? This oval should be the same as this oval, should be the same as this oval in width. And this should fit kind of here, it should also fit here. So everything is the same distance apart. This is what gives you consistency in your proportions for your words. So I've had some students ask me, how wide should that oval be? From what I've seen and what from I've read, there really isn't a consensus necessarily or like, about how wide this should be. Um, I could be wrong. Generally speaking, I kind of go by eye, which isn't like the best <laughs> maybe for someone who's teaching, but um, I'm not super picky pants with like how wide that should be. I kind of just see what it looks like. And like, if it's like this, it's gonna look kind of blobby. It doesn't look like an oval anymore. It kind of looks like a weird smushed ball, which is unpleasant, right? So I think I know when when people are doing Spencerian, they'll talk about like units and stuff and like how units wide. I, I, I don't really do that, especially for beginners. I'm more interested in like making sure that that oval fits consistently in between my different letters. So hopefully that was helpful. Now, I've done that in pencil. I'm gonna do the same thing with my pointed pen. Hopefully I'm warmed up enough, but I kind of like when I mess up when I'm doing calligraphy myself because I find that when people try and pick up a pointed pen, they're annoyed and upset with themselves that they can't do it on the first try. And I can tell you straight up, it's not easy. It is not a... Uh, it's not a natural movement that anyone does anymore. So like, don't feel bad if you're, if it's not perfect off the bat, um, it does take practice. Um, and that, that I can tell you, like, I, I don't know how, how much practice I should have kept count. <laughs> how, much, how, how many hours of time, like I spent just doing the basic strokes, doing a letter. Um, and actually another, hold on calligraphy tip for you. Uh, something that I find that uh, is useful uh, is when you're practicing something very specific, let's say you're practicing the letter A, for example, do three or four and then look at it and compare it to whatever you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I know, right? Animation. Look at me go. <laughs> so technologically savvy. Um, when, but yeah, like, let's say you do three or four, you look at it and then you're like, oh, it's not exact, but you're not repeating the same mistake over and over again. And you're not getting that muscle memory by accident of making the same mistake over and over again. So like, I would recommend doing maybe uh, a four or five look at it like, oh, maybe uh, my oval is not a, a great oval for all four of them. So for the next five, I'm going to really try and work on that oval and try and improve it uh, versus 
doing a whole page of the letter G, all of them are a little bit off. All of them are a little bit challenging. And then you've muscle memoried that challenge or that like incorrect stroke into your hand. And it's hard to break those habits. And now back to me. <laughs> so yeah, there's my little clear fee tip for you. So We're gonna do the same, the same thing. I'm gonna get my ink out of the way of this guy. So I also wanted to point your attention a little bit to the camera on your bottom left. And the reason why is because you're gonna see the angle that I have that nib at at the paper. And this is why I prefer Twitch to Instagram for trying to show calligraphy because you can see it up on top. And because I have a camera here, you can see what the nib looks like over here. Cause I find that it's really hard to tell on uh, when it's just a top down, personally speaking. Plus I like to talk with my hands and who, like, you know, you wanna see my face sometimes? Like I'm here, I exist. I'm not just like a ghostly hand hang working out of paper. <laughs> um. Okay, yeah, so like we'll start with that same thing. We'll start with that entry stroke. I'm gonna try and make sure I'm not curling my shoulders then. Oh, and I have a little. So actually, I'll show. This happens sometimes. Can I don't know if you can see it. It's like really tiny. I have, there's like a little foozle in between of like thread or something in between my nib times this happens sometimes and then if you try and do a hairline it just goes and it like drags it up and it ruins what you're doing I hate that so we got our whoop, we got our entry stroke our little our hairline which is here uh, I'm not the best at doing these on their own. That's all right. And then we're gonna do a downstroke. So with the downstroke, this is my A center, this is my waistline, this is my baseline, this is my D center is here. So I'm gonna do the big one. So I'm gonna do a downstroke press, hold towards myself, even pressure, and then there's my downstroke. So Straight downstrokes like that can be challenging. With copper plate, kind of, for most people, I would say, having a squared off top and bottom, let me zoom in a little more. That's match as much as I can go. So, we're opening the tines, we're pulling down towards and then we're closing the time. Sometimes that happens where it is not a square. No problem, go back in there and you fill it in. No one will know. <laughs> um, but yeah, like catching up your work like that is totally fine. Totally acceptable. If you can do it on the first shot, like great, good for you. Like I, mo most of the time I can't. Um, I'm good at doing the one on the bottom usually. I always, I always struggle with the one on the top. Uh, I, the, there we go. Actually, this is, this is good because there's not as much ink on here. So you can kind of really see what I'm doing. So I'm pressing and you can see the tines are separating and I'm pulling down. And then I'm gonna rotate onto the left to close that tine. So then it creates that line right here. So that's what the nib is doing. So you can see here, I'm not that good at kind of rounds. So I would just go in after, just kind of like fill that in after. But that's what's, that's what's happening with your nib. Really fun. And like you can see as well, which I had talked about before, I'm trying not to use my wrist. I'm not using my fingers really to, I'm, I'm using my fingers to press, but I'm not using it to manipulate the direction that I'm working. I'm not doing this. I'm keeping this pretty stable and I'm just moving my whole arm. Whole arm movement for the win. 
keeps my back from dying and my shoulders from dying so that I can be here for you guys. You're welcome. <laughs> so, and then we're gonna do the smaller downstroke. So yeah, you'll definitely see me if you ever watch me on stream, like I'll go do these and I just, I automatically just go in and fill them in. So there we go, there are some, there are some downstrokes. So now we're gonna go into the underturns. So again, this is your base enders here, waistline, baseline, descender is here. And I think, yeah, you guys can see those, those lines on the, on the screen, which is great. So we're gonna go for our underturn. So pressing. And then as I'm turning, I'm going up. So I kind of like to think of this like a clock. I'll turn that brightness up just a scooch. So this here is about, or it should be 55 degrees, okay? Where this downstroke is, this should be 55. I start to turn, if I'm imagining this being 12 noon, and then this being six, I start turning here at about 7 p.m. That's very tiny. This is at around 7 p.m. I start to turn so that there's a little triangle that lives right there in my underneath my underturn. Uh, I think that it's just a fun visual for me to like, I just look for the little triangles um, whenever I have anything that has kind of a curve on it and that all those triangles are about the same size and you'll see kind of what I mean when I we continue moving on so it's a downstroke and then we're turning and then we're going up into that entry stroke hairline um, this one and this one aren't exactly the same there's a bit of a difference for the purposes of practicing it's okay um, this is something that I would want to look at if this was being in a word for le like, let's say if this was for the letter A, I would want to make sure that this and this one are going to be consistently in the width here and here, but I'm looking here. Oh yeah. My little triangle. She fits underneath. Yay. It has, it has a home. And then you can do the same thing with the big underturn. So a sender. Oh, sorry, not there. Ascender, waistline, baseline, descender. We're starting up here at the ascender. We're pressing. We're gonna turn it around seven. We're gonna go back up. And I th I like to aim at like to what one o'clock would be if I'm gonna imagine an analog clock. Um, there we go, a little bit better. There you go. That one was the best one. This one was not good. This one was not good. It kind of curved, which was weird. This one's better. This one's straight down and then we're curving it around seven and then going back up here and I'm aiming for around one o'clock. That's kind of how I think about it. So then we're going to look at our descender loops. So the descender loop is going to start. Descender waistline, baseline, descender. The descender loop is gonna start here at the waistline, we're gonna pull, we're gonna go left, oops, pull, left, and then up. So we're having a curve here. There's a triangle there, because right here is around 5 p.m. This is six, this is seven. I hope that that makes sense. That's uh, like I said, that's how I think about it. It's how I teach it. Cause I'm not a huge fan of it all the way down. And then you were, we're switching it up here. I find this looks really heavy. Whereas I find this looks a little bit more uh, delicate when we're kind of changing 
the uh, the weight as we're turning the corner because also as well I'm keeping the same pressure from here to here give or take being very consistent as I'm pulling down then as I'm turning I'm releasing that pressure a little bit and then by the time I hit six o'clock it's right here I'm at no pressure anymore so I'm bringing it then back up to the baseline when this turns into a J show, show you quickly now the letters will be coming next week the letter group one um, we're going down and then we're going up again when it turns into a J I cross it's hard to tell on there because my guidelines aren't super clear for you guys I'm crossing like right underneath where the line is can I turn that down a little bit can you see better mm, yeah not so much that's all right something that I like to do too oops is like this but then when I'm about to cross I will sometimes lift my nib and then I'll put it back down over here so I don't drag my pen through the wet ink. This is a personal preference of mine. It's kind of what I like to do. All right, then we're gonna go into our overturns. So the overturn is, we're starting with that entry stroke right here. And we're gonna then pull it down into a down stroke. So Again, if this is 12 noon, at around 1 p.m., I am then starting that pressure. So then my little triangle can live there. And we're pulling that down. We're always aiming for those squared off bottoms. If we can do it in one shot, great. If you can't do it in one shot, go in and touch it up. No one will know unless you tell them or you show them on live on stream like I'm doing right now just like I'm just gonna go in and touch that and make it look all nice and perfect all nice and pretty all right and now we're gonna go into the a center loop which we're starting at the waistline a center baseline D center yep and we're starting at the waistline, we're gonna bring it back up. And as we're turning, we're gonna press down and then square off that bottom. So this one went a little high. I'm gonna do that again. I'm also moving my wrist a little bit more just because of the way that my paper has to fit. So you see in my camera. Uh, so do as I say, not as I do. Don't use your wrist, use your arm. Cause I have a, where my, where my iPad is, it's on uh, like a like a box. Um, I I am getting a, an arm for this thing next week, the week after. So I, I will have like my full desk space, which would be great because then I'll be able to push the the paper pad out of my way, um, so I can be proper like to where my body is. Because right now I'm like I'm a little bit cramped, so my wrist is is doing a little bit more work than it should be. Um, but yeah, do as I say, not as I do. Use your arms, not your wrist. Cool, cool. So we're going to go here, waistline, up, and then at around 11, we're going to go down, and then we're going to square off that bottom. So this one I find is much prettier. It still, it breaks that A center thing a little bit, which I'm not a huge fan of. It's fine. I'm just picky. But uh, if we're thinking about that little triangle having a home up here, this is what we're aiming for. So I'm bringing it up, and then add, I'm putting that pressure on at around, this is 12, at around 11 p.m. or 11 a.m., whatever, at 11 o'clock. <laughs> I'm starting to put pressure back on. So we're getting that nice little swell. Uh, and then probably from here to here, it's the same pressure from, from there down. And then we're gonna go to the compound curve. The compound curve is fun to do <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. It's uh, lots and lots of practice. Yeah, I was going to say, lots of practice. Many, many hours. I, I mentioned before, I'm like, I wish I, I should have kept track of how many hours of practice. I don't think I'm quite at 10,000 yet, <laughs> but I'm sure I'll get there soon. 
Uh, so we're gonna do the compound curve. So we're gonna do that thin entry stroke. And then like the overturn, we're going down, but then instead of finishing it with a square down here, we're gonna continue turning and go back up again. So it's kind of like you were having an overturn plus an underturn, had a little baby and made a compound curve. How fun. So we're up, down, up. The width between these two should be pretty much the same. I'm still looking for that triangle that's here, that's living. And the thickest part of the stroke, you zoom that in, the thickest part of the stroke should be right in the middle, right there. And we're turning here at around 1 p.m. And then we're turning here at around 5 and we're bringing it back up again. And there's also, you can see a little triangle there. You can see a little triangle here. So this is how we know that there's the, the proportionality can remain the same. All right. And then the last, but definitely not the least, the oval. So there are two ways to do the oval. Uh, there's one way that I prefer to do it. And then there's the other way that a lot of other people do that I just wasn't taught initially. So I'm really not used to it. Uh, I've been trying it out a little bit more in my own work. Uh, I haven't decided if I like it or not. It just is the way that it is. So the way that I do the oval, if we're thinking like a clock again, this is your waistline, this is your baseline. I like to start at one o'clock and I bring it around and over and then I'll press and then I'll lift and then I'll bring it back to itself. I know that you can see that connection line. Generally speaking, this will always be covered. If this is an O, this is where your connection to your O is. If this is an A, like your, your underturn hides that connection line. So I don't particularly care if it's not super like exact, exact, exact. However, there is another way to do it, which is where you start at noon and you just press, oh, sorry, start at noon, press uh, here, press, and then up again. I'm not super practiced at this way because uh, this wasn't how I was taught. I was taught this way, not this way. Uh, but this way here, you don't see that uh, connection line that you would if I'm doing it my way. So it really is more of a personal preference. Uh, I find because most of my things, I'm used to thinking about it like a clock and it's like nothing for me really starts at noon. Everything starts at like one o'clock or I'm turning at like five or turning at seven. Uh, starting at one and bringing it back around to one o'clock just makes more sense to me specifically. So I've been, again, whatever floats your boat, whatever is a little bit easier. So I'll do them all one more shot, just all in a row. And I'll zoom out just to scooch. So we're going entry stroke, we're doing downstroke, baby downstroke, we're doing underturn, and I was just touching that actually here, I'll, I'll go in a little early, a little bit more, there we go, underturn. We're doing our descender loop. We're doing our overturn. And then we're doing our ascender loop. We're doing then our compound curve. And then we're doing our oval. That oval could have been better. So if I'm gonna analyze my own work right now, this one and this one, 
should be the same width across. They're not, this one's a bit more wide. Something to be aware of. Generally, when you're looking at the descender loop and the ascender loop, they should be the same, regardless if you turn it around or not. This one is a little bit to either, either I didn't start pressing enough here, uh, like down enough, or vice versa, uh, I was a little bit too light on this side, but the thickness is not the same uh, for both of those loops. We're also gonna look at the uh, consistency of the weight and the thickness of the lines between here, 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 and here. Uh, also, that should be squared off. Et voila. Um, and then all of these spaces in between here to here, and here, and here, and here, should all be the same-ish width of this oval that I made here. This is what gives copper plate a very consistent feel, a very consistent look. Uh, we're also looking at that 55, oh, my pen is a bit dry now. We're also looking at that 55 degree angle. We're looking at your ascender, your waistline, your baseline, and your descender. We're looking at those squared tops and bottoms. So yeah, these are your eight. I am so not good at just writing properly. Or like normally with like a pointed pen. I can only do calligraphy with it. <laughs> but these are your eight basic strokes. And this is what makes your whole alphabet. Yes, a lot of details, but yeah, they do make it look really nice. Uh, oh, I also, I also don't know if there's a consensus either for the angle at which the exit stroke, entry stroke, whatever the hairline is, what angle that should be at. Uh, when I was doing the class with Martha, Lauren's book first been seeing, she spoke a little bit about copper plate and she was like, there's nowhere where it really tells you what angle it should be at. So generally speaking, this is at 55. I kind of aim for like that about 50 degrees probably. Um, but I specifically kind of think of it like, a, like I said, like a clock. So, and I think with that, I'm going to stop the, I'll stop my, my Spotify so we don't have to listen to the Walmart ad. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, this is, this is that good old content you're gonna be getting for me once a week. Um, so next week, what I'm gonna be doing is letter group one, which is, uh, geez, I can't name, name all right now. There's like, how many letter groups, uh, how many letters are in letter group one? Like nine, 10, something like that. I'll be going through that next week. Yeah, I like I said, I think it's like, yeah, it's about the 50-ish degree, but like I aim it like it's a clock. So I'm aiming for uh, like a one, one o'clock. <laughs> so if you want to come back uh, next week, I'm going to be doing, uh, like I said, letter group one. We'll go through that pretty slowly. I can do it with pencil uh, and with the nib and ink. Um, you know, whatever, it's all good. Maybe with a marker, if someone wants me to do that, I can show you how to do that too. Uh, but really, once you understand this and you understand how this makes your alphabet, all of a sudden, like you can start messing with things a bit easier. Uh, Cause that's something that I, and I know a lot of beginners, if they don't, if they don't understand this part, sometimes there's legibility issues when someone starts uh, learning. Cause you, you, you don't understand how the letters are built. So you're breaking a lot of rules that you don't know are there. Cause I'm all for breaking the rules. I'm fine with that. That's what a, like some of my work is, I'm like a baseline, who needs a baseline? I'm just gonna bounce that thing up and down and who cares? Like it doesn't matter. Um, or like being consistent ascender, descender, pff, I'll throw a flourish in there. I'll make it really big and really wide and stretch it out and it doesn't really matter. But I also am doing it purposefully. It's not by accident. Um, so 
that's also one of the things that I really wanted to highlight while I was doing the teaching on Twitch is that like having the basic fundamentals, at least an understanding, a baseline of what this means can help you so much when you're doing hand lettering or uh, calligraphy or faux calligraphy or brush lettering or, you know, whatever you want to do, just having this can be really useful. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it there for today. Stream for a couple of hours. And I'm a little thirsty, a little hungry. Although, actually, you know, I have my bottle of water, like literally right here. What's calligraphy? Calligraphy is beautiful lettering. It's beautiful, beautiful writing. That's literally what it means. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, actually, hold on, I have, a, I have a paper. I can show you. So it was National Handwriting Day a few days ago, and I had made this. This is a pretty good, <laughs> like, what is calligraphy? All of this stuff is calligraphy. And that's my garbage handwriting. And then all the calligraphy. I thought it was fun, a fun little post I did on Instagram. Um, but yeah, I'll end it here for today. Uh, if you stuck around for the whole thing, like, good for you. Like, hats off to you. Uh, I've recorded it on my own piece on my on my own laptop, so um, I'm gonna try to get this onto YouTube. We'll see if I can. I am very bad at the tubes, except for watching stuff. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, I'll be back next week on Thursday specifically to teach, but then also next week on Monday is my I do whatever I'd like to do on my stream. So I'll be doing, I'll be here Monday as well uh, at around 3.30 if you want to come join. If not, Thursday, teaching, letter group one, we'll get at it. It's all good. Um, yeah, I guess. Oh, no, there we go. Oh, not a tip. I just wanted to say goodbye, <laughs> but just with my face. So thanks for coming by. Appreciate you. Uh, thanks a lot. And I'll be back next Thursday to teach or Monday for just good old calligraphy content. Bye.